So I ended up, uh, we were talking about Sargon of Akkad and um, how there was a legend of him, right? I mean, going back to the picture, right? There's a depiction of him, very famous depiction, okay? And part of this section is cut off. I'm going to just read out loud, though, but I'm going to read this to you. And then I'm going to go over some other materials. So it says, Sargon, the mighty king, king of Akkad, am I. My mother was lowly. My father I did not know. The brother of my father dwelt in the mountain. My city is Azupiranu, Piranu, <coughs> excuse me, which is situated on the bank of Puratu, or Euphrates. My lowly mother conceived me in secret. She brought me forth. She placed me in a basket of reeds. Now, here's where I want you to pay attention. She placed me in a basket of reeds. She closed my entrance with bitumen. She cast me upon the rivers, which did not overflow me. The river carried me. It brought me to Aki, the irrigator. Aki, the irrigator, is the goodness, in the goodness of his heart, lifted me out. Aki, the irrigator, as his own son, brought me up. Aki the irrigator, as his gardener, appointed me. When I was a gardener, the goodness, the goddess Ishtar loved me. And for four years, I ruled the kingdom. And he talks about ruling other peoples. Okay, so what's significant about this? Let's go to this story from the Bible. Exodus 2, 3 through 6 and 10. A famous story for those who grow up in the biblical, biblical tradition. Um, if you do not come from the biblical tradition, just know that in what is called often the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible or the Torah, there's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those first five books, the Chumash, the first five, uh, uh, are the, uh, the stories of the Bible about the ancient people of the Middle East and which are going to become ancient Israel and, uh, 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 Jews who are then going to be incorporated into Christianity and then the story into Islam. Okay. So Exodus 2 says, from the Torah, Torah says, When she could hide him no longer, she took him uh, for him a basket made of bulrushes and uh, daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. Uh, and his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done with him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. While her young uh, women walked beside the river, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and, became, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. So here is the origin stories of Moses. Do we see a connection between putting in a basket uh, with bitumen and reeds down a river of Sargon and Moses? Now, why is this motif being used? So similarly, um, that's a good question, but I mean, would we agree that there is regardless that we can see that there is similarity a similarity between these two stories on this theme right okay so I just thought I would point that out um, so let's go on then to uh, talk a little bit more about the uh, the Cadians they absorb many things from the Sumerians the calendar the writing system the computation methods and then they spread these ideas to many lands and they're origin stories, such as we saw with um, Sargon. And this really becomes one of history's first empires. And so you'll see, we'll see this theme too, right? It's not uncommon when you conquer, when, when you see one group of people conquer another, they absorb many of the things that come from that culture. And we start seeing all of these uh, uh, different ideas grafted together from various peoples. Um, and so then I want to go again and talk about something that comes out of these traditions that we're going to look into the Bible as well. Um, so he starts off, we have a Sumerian king list, right? It's written around 2,105 years uh, uh, before Jesus uh, was born, or before the Common Era also. So on the top it says, after kingship, 
he um, had descended from heaven, which is that theme again, kingship descended from heaven, Eridu became the seat of kingship. In Eridu, uh, Elulim reigned 28,800 years as king. This other king reigns for what? 36,000 years. Two kings reigned 64,800 years. We go down the total of five kings reigning from 241,200 years. And then the flood then swept over. We're going to learn more about this uh, um, tradition in these ancient Mesopotamian texts along with the Bible as well. After the flood had swept over and kingship had descended from heaven, Kish became the seat of kingship. And again, these astronomically large numbers as we go far back. And then uh, as we come up here and it goes through the list of all these people that, that are, are being mentioned, um, this king reigned for only 420 years as king. Here again, we see uh, 1,200. And then we get Gilgamesh, whose father was a nomad, reigned 126 years. And then his son reigned for 30. And then we see one reigning for nine. Um, and the numbers get smaller as the time goes up in terms of the length of reigns. Now, interesting, right? Now let's take a look at the biblical tradition. Let's look at Genesis chapter 5, first book of the Bible. This is the written account of Adam's line. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them. So we go down here. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had the son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him uh, Seth. After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Adam lived 939 years and then he died. And then we go down to here. And after he became the father of Enosh, Seth lived 807. Seth lived for a total of 912 years, according to what it says here. That would be, right, creeping on a thousand years. And then we have all the way here to Methuselah. And I have a cut down here at the end. It mentions that he dies at the age of 999. So really a thousand years. Um... Certainly most of us um, don't know anybody who lived that long, and most people don't believe that, that that people could live or did live that long. All I'm really trying to say, though, is not having a debate about whether or not this is literal history or not. But can we not see that these astronomical ages and lengths of reigns that we saw in the Sumerian texts about looking at people in the past are also being applied in the biblical, biblical tradition? And then later on, the Bible will no longer tell stories of humans lasting that long. This is only supposed to be in the distant past, before, in the times before the flood. And that's where the Bible tells the story. And the flood was also mentioned in the Sumerian text. I'm going to stop there and then we'll continue on this discussion.